Well, good evening. Uh, welcome back to uh, many of you who maybe were gone on holiday there. Uh, that's how my British friends call it, holiday. Um, want to welcome you to Hope. My name is Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here. I'm in my uh, ninth year on staff. Before that, I uh, was an attender here and started attending while I was uh, at the University of Minnesota. Um, I am married to Jill, and we have uh, two boys. And one of our traditions, we, we love traditions at our household, one of our traditions is that every New Year's we go out to Don Pablo's, because that's very New Year's-esque, right? Uh, I, I have no re- reason why we chose Don Pablo's. I guess we like the all-you-can-eat chips. Uh, but we go there and we, we talk about the year that was, and we also take some time to uh, share a little bit about what we're thankful for. And we look forward to what's coming up in the next year and, and perhaps even share a couple resolutions, things that we're thinking about. Anybody, anybody in the crowd do, do resolutions? Oh, we do questions at this service. I always forget that. Uh, you know, we're going to stop later on. And if you have a question, you can throw it out there. It, it, if it happens to be on topic with, you know, the Bible and what we're talking about, that's great. Uh, if you want to talk Vikings, Packers, you know, we can just step outside. Uh, if there's, <laughs> there's something you need to share or... Uh, all right, um, but we're gonna. You can ask a question later. But uh, anybody New, New Year's resolutions out there? Any any of you guys? Any you like vow to not because you're just like you failed to. We don't have to. You don't have to raise your hand. That's okay. Um, but you know, pe- people tend to have the the standard resolutions. Uh, some some related to finances, others exercise, food, and we. You know, I could list a bunch more up here, but I thought it would be much more compelling to track on. Twitter, those people that have already failed their New Year's resolutions, because there's this beautiful thing called a hashtag where people will actually hashtag resolutions fail. And so we can, we can know now, you know, on January 6th, people that have already not made it. Uh, and if you need more, I, I posted more of these on, on my blog, so you can, if this isn't enough, but let's, let's take a look at some of these fails already this year. Kate says, can't get the taste of spinach out of my mouth. How long will this healthy eating last? I like spinach. I don't think spinach is that bad. Um, Natalia said, on that note, my dad made my fave chicken soup, which I can't have. Hashtag vegetarian probs. (laughs) Dad, not even supporting her, just like making this nice chicken soup. Uh, She can't even eat it. Uh, Danella, Jane, said, just made a huge batch of gooey chocolate and hazelnut cookies. Why can't I crave grapes? Or lentils or something. <laughs> Gonna have to take that up with God. Like, why can't I crave, like, healthy stuff? Why has it got to be all this unhealthy food? Look at these ones. Tracy says, has anyone broken their New Year's resolutions yet? I definitely did not eat half a pack of Oreos last night. <laughs> and then Lacey said, one time I said I was going to crush 2013. The only thing I've crushed so far this year is a large bag of potato chips. <laughs> I love this. People just confess it all right there uh, on Twitter, and then you can rip it off and put it in a sermon. It's great. Um, Sunapal said, got chair aerobics DVD, busted out the chair, but just ended up sitting on it. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that there was like this whole genre of chair aerobics. Uh, are you guys well aware of this? Uh, this could be something worth looking into. Um, <laughs> And then uh, Joanna said, workout clothes on, got to the gym, iPod died, 10 minutes later, bored. It was a good try. <laughs> 10 minutes. That was, that was her attempt. I mean, look at the resolve. I mean, just incredible resolve in her New Year's resolution. 10 minutes, bored, done. Can't, can't do it. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you a question. How, what, what percent do you think of people never succeed, but fail on their resolution every year? What percent of people? 97. Not that high. They said 24%. Now, what percent of people are successful in achieving their resolution? What do you think? Four? They said eight. So there's a great chasm in there of like, so... We have 8% that succeeded, 24% that didn't. What are you in-betweeners talking about here? 
But it is on a lot of people's minds. Perhaps it's on your mind. Um, we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about the topic of growth changing everything. Growth changes everything. And if you want to change, we're going to call you to grow. And we're going to take a look at this topic in, in three different forms. This week, we're going to talk about it at the individual level, that growth changes everything in human hearts. Internal growth will bring forth an external change. Okay, so that's this week. We're going to talk about that just coming up. Next week, we're going to talk about what growth changes in relationships. Individual growth bringing forth communal health. Talking about gospel and community, which is big, big here at Hope. What does it look like to be a gospel friend? What does it look like to come together with others for their benefit, for your gain as well? And then week three, growth changes everything at Hope. And if you have been around Hope for any length of time, we're growing. And that brings forth varied challenges. Yet, yet, we want to embrace this growth. Why? Because we want to see a city impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we're on this corner of 7th and 10th. We want to see a city impacted with the good news, the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we hope that growth changes everything for good within hope so we might see a city impacted. This week, though, we're looking at growth changing everything within human hearts, internal uh, growth for external change. And, and to set this up for this week's message, I want to I wanna share a movie review. And the movie reviewer is uh, a, a man by the name Sam Richardson. I don't know Sam personally. I just came across this on Facebook as I was studying for this sermon, just try, trying to track different commenters. Uh, no. Um, Sam, Sam shares uh, his, his review. Went to the movies with the wife. I don't think Sam's a professional reviewer. Um, I don't think most professional reviews include with the wife. Uh, went to the movies with the wife. We saw this obscure movie I had never heard of. Some French foreign film. They must have been giving away free tickets because the lines were out the door. Anyway, the movie starts and Wolverine is singing his guts out. <laughs> then Catwoman starts crying. And singing. It's all very moving. The only problem was the girl next to me, who had apparently read the book or something, starts singing along. It was very distracting. So Wolverine is on the run from the gladiator. Because Catwoman had a baby at Borat's house. I don't have a picture, I apologize. But now she wants Wolverine to care for her. Time skip. A bunch of people get shot and in the end, everyone dies. <laughs> this epic masterpiece, and that's what, that's what he writes. And then he concludes, four stars. I don't know how many stars that's out of, actually. <laughs> uh, but I want to I wanna talk tonight about this convert, confrontation between Valjean and Javert. For those who don't know, uh, Valjean has uh, committed a crime and Javert has been seeking him for years. And then they meet. And there's this confrontation. And Valjean says this. I'm not going to sing. I mean, you're, you know that, right? I'm not going to sing. Two, four, no, I won't. Uh, Valjean says, before you say another word, Javert, before you chain me up like a slave again, listen to me, there is something I must do. This woman leave, leaves behind a suffering child. There is none but me who can intercede. In mercy's name, three days are all I need. So this guy has been chasing down Valjean for years, and now Having found him, Valjean is saying, I need three more days. In mercy's name, can you give me three more days to care for this woman? Because she leaves behind a suffering child. In mercy's name, three days are all I need. Then I'll return. I pledge my word. Then I'll return. And Javert responds, you must 
think me mad. I've hunted you across the years. Men like you can never change. A man such as you. And tonight I want to zero in, I want to hone in on that one phrase right there. Men like you can never change. As we talk about internal growth, as we talk about kind of in the wake of resolutions, as we talk about life change, people have told you this. People maybe in your life, parents, siblings, co-workers, friends, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse, some people have told you, you will never change. You've been like this, you're always going to be like that. You may have believed them. You might say this to yourself. I've always had a temper. I'm always going to have a temper. It'll never change. You might even add on some other things like it runs in my family. I'm just like my dad. And you actually buy this baloney that you can never change, that you will never change. What we're going after tonight is, is what could be described as God's resolution for us, one of God's desires. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 this, this is the will of God, your sanctification. God desires, God is resolved that you would be sanctified. What does that mean, to be sanctified? Wayne Grudem, who is a, a theologian, gives us a very, I think, accessible definition. He says this, sanctification, fancy theological word, that is a progressive work of God and people that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. Looking for a, a, a simple definition of what does it mean that God would desire us to be sanctified? It's a work that he does in us, and it's a work that we do in conjunction with him that results in us being more and more free from sin and more and more like Christ in our actual lives, that there's actually change that comes about in our lives. That's God's desire. That's his will for you in Christ. And so we're going to spend the rest of our time in Romans chapter 6. If you have a Bible, you can open it up. If you have an insert there, or it'll be on the screen. But we are going to spend the rest of our time in all of Romans chapter 6, all 23 verses. And if you're like me, short attention span, like some people have those long Facebook status updates. You got, have you seen these? And they actually have, like they get so long-winded that Facebook says, we're cutting you off. And we're going we're gonna to put a little link here that says continue reading. And people can click on it if they want. Anybody like me where you're just like, that's just too much to ask. That is too big of a commitment as I'm scrolling through Facebook. I've already given you four lines. I read through your first four lines. I'm not giving you another four, you know. Or do you get like YouTube videos that go over like a minute where it's like, four minutes? Are you kidding me? And then your friends call you up and like, hey dude, Lord of the Rings, extended cut, man, we'll be up all night. And you're like, I'm in. And But we can't give like four minutes on YouTube, you know, but you'll sit 24 hours straight looking all Lord of the Rings. Isn't that crazy? Um, that's neither here nor there. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. It says, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? So this is, this is actually, this is, you know, obviously coming after something. What comes before this? Well, if, if you're astute, probably Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, because we're in Romans 6. So we need to know, when it says, what shall we say then? We need to go back and understand, well, what came before this? And so I want to jump back in our Bible, turn to the left a couple pages there. What precedes this? Because if you jump right into chapter 6, which is all about, sanctification, all about this progressive work of God in our lives in conjunction with us as we get, grow freer from sin and more in line with Christ, okay, if we jump right into that without understanding chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we become just like everybody else doing the New Year's resolution, giving our best effort to change our lives without understanding fully where does change come from, where does growth come from, what is the foundation of of our sanctification in Christ, of growing in the likeness of Christ. And so if we jump back into chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we get to hear more and more about the gospel. We get to hear more and more about the good news, the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
It says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And not just that, in Romans 3, we read that all, that uh, Paul says we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, essentially everybody, is under sin. As it is written, now this is a quote from the Psalms, so uh, coming from our Old Testament, way back, you know, thousands of years before Paul, the author of the letter to the Romans here, writes his letter, he sees this, and he quotes, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. If you want to understand the need that God has in bringing forth the gospel and bringing forth Christ, hanging his son on a cross to die in our place, you have to understand our plight, our true condition is no one seeks for God. None of us understand him. None of us want him. We turn aside. We who were created to glorify God become worthless because we choose other things, lesser things. Things that are not God. Continuing on in chapter 3, there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no distinction. Now, if you look around this room, there's all sorts of distinctions in what we wear and what our hair looks like, in our gender, maybe where we come from, where we're going, what we do with our time Monday through Friday. There's all sorts of distinctions. But spiritually speaking, no distinction. All of us have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And not only that, look what God does. He justifies us by his grace as a gift. Big, fancy theological word. Yeah, we can understand this word. Justified means Declared righteous. In the cross, with Jesus, with what Good Friday says, God forgives you of your sin. He negates your sin. But not just that, he grants you his son's perfect righteousness. And in God's economy, he declares you just. He declares you innocent. You are made right with him. And this comes as a, by grace as a gift through the redemption, the the purchasing back that is ours in Christ Jesus. And this Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, is to be received by faith. God put Jesus forward as a propitiation, as a wrath recipient, as a wrath bearer. He takes God's punishment on our behalf. He stands in the way and saves us. And so if we're looking at chapters 1 through 5, we need to understand, we need to recognize that there is a grace that comes from God, a grace that is able to save us. This is not something you've earned. It's not something that God looks at you and says, you're so good, I I must do this for you, that it's some sort of exchange. No, when we were hell-bent away from him, this is something that he invites us to. He makes peace with, with us. Through the cross, when we were living in darkness, he brings forth his light. And when we were dead in our sins, he brings us to newness of life. And so there is a grace that God extends to us to save us, to justify us, to make peace with us, to adopt us into his family. So that's what is coming before us. And let's look a little bit more at what John Owen says here about this grace to save. He says, They may make men self-justiciaries or hypocrites. What may make men and women self-justiciaries or hypocrites rather than Christians? All things not grace. Think about the, the different things that we do to hold up in front of other people this veneer, this facade, this mask of Christianity. I'm a Christian. Why? I go to church. I read a Bible. I pray. I talk to other people about my faith. All these things can be good things. But it is grace which makes you a Christian. God giving and granting grace that saves you. And John Owen goes on to say, It grieves me oftentimes to see poor souls that have a zeal for God, a desire for eternal welfare, kept by such directors and directions under a hard, burdensome, outside worship and service of God with many specious endeavors for mortification. That meaning, specious endeavors meaning, uh, looks to be plausible, but yet falls short. 
Going to church seems to be a very plausible thing that would make you a Christian. Attending a Bible study, having a mentor, these seem to be plausible things that would make one a Christian, yet they fall short because nothing, nothing makes you a Christian except the grace that is ours in Christ. It's these things that appear to be a mortification or a killing sin. This is an utter ignorance of the righteousness of Christ and the unequatedness with His Spirit. Persons and things of this kind, I know too many. So as we talk about sanctification and walking in newness of life, do not forsake chapters 1 through 5 that speak of justification. God making peace with us through the cross. That's the foundation. That's where it starts. Without that, you are under the power and reign of sin. But as we respond to the gospel, God breaks that power in our lives. And then we might got something here. Let's go to Romans 6 here. What shall we say then to Romans 1 through 5? Having received this gospel, having believed in Jesus, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? If I sin and God covers it, then if I sin some more, God will cover it some more. Then I can sin more and God will cover it more. And then grace will abound. Is that how grace abounds? I think the distinction that's coming here in Romans chapter 6 is that there is a grace that saves that we can respond to that first time, that initial time that you hear your sins can be taken away, and then there's this other grace, a grace that sanctifies. By no means, no means do we sin so that grace may abound. There is a grace that can preserve, a grace that can cause you to choose away from sin. There is a grace in sanctification, and that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of our time together. Look at, let's look at some several truths from chapter 6 here. Truth number one. In looking at God's will that you would be sanctified, it says, how can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Do you hear the rationale? Do you hear the truth and the promise there? You've been united to Christ in his death. So when Christ dies, you die with him. And later we're going to see he died. When he died, he died to sin. So as we die with him, we die to sin. And and Paul's just saying, well, if you died to sin, how can you live in it any longer? It doesn't make sense. There's inconsistency there. No, when you die die with Christ, you die to sin. United with him in his death. This is a truth that we're going to come back to again and again tonight. When you're united to Christ, you're united in his death. You're not only united in his death, you're also united with Christ in his resurrection. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, you and me, might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So think of this, that when Christ dies, you die with him, and as he is raised, as he is raised from the dead, To live unfettered, no longer can death keep hold of him. You likewise are raised with him to newness of life. That the old you has died. There's an old core that died, age 18. There's an old core that is dead. And a new core was brought forth back in 1997. You and I were raised with Christ for for the sake of newness of life. If you've been united with him in his death. If you believe. In the death of the Son, if you believed in the gospel, if you believed in Romans 1 through 5, you have also been united with him in his resurrection, raised for the sake of newness of life. Why is this union so important? Look what it says in verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him. In order, listen to this, in order. What's the purpose of all this? That the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Jump back up to verse 6 there. We know our old self was crucified with him. That's, that's a spiritual, theological truth and reality. For those that have set their faith and belief on Jesus Christ, you've died with Christ. And this was in order that the body of sin, that your flesh, 
fancy Greek word, a, a sart, that that would be brought to nothing. Not that you would be brought to death because you're nothing. No, God has desires for you. God created you. There's something that God had in mind, yet there's a part of you that resists God, that hates God, that will never be sanctified, that will never bow its knee to Jesus. You have a flesh that is bent against God. And the Bible uses certain verbs when talking about the flesh, when talking about this body of sin. It doesn't say put up with it. It doesn't say appease it. It doesn't say sanctify it. It says kill it. Crucify your flesh with its desires and passions. You are to deal it death blows every day. Moving on in verse 9. Truth number three, Christ is greater than sin and death. Christ is greater than sin and death. This, this, is, this is for me where the game changes. If you're, if you're thinking about life change and you're, you're desirous to see changes in your life because of what Christ has done through the gospel and in your sanctification and you're walking and living with God, this verse is critical to your understanding of this. Christ is greater than sin and death. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Have you thought on that? Do you understand the, the ramifications of that truth that, that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again? Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. And the life he lives, he lives to God. Many of us believe, as we think about power, and we think about authority, and we think about din- dominion, and we think about the non-negotiables of life, one of which we believe is death. Do you see God, do you see Christ as greater, as stronger than sin and death? He has dominion over it. He holds the keys of Hades and death. He's stronger. He's bigger. He's greater. Death cannot hold him. Death does not have authority over him. He holds death underneath him. He has dominion over it. He has power, rule, reign. And then you and I, Look at this Jesus, and we say to him, I'll never change. This sin is too great. This temptation is too strong. God, I can't change. I won't change. And I read this verse, and I'm confronted because I believe that. Certain areas of my life, it's just, it's just, it's just helpless, God. I'm just never... Been fighting it for so long. It's not going to change. Yet Romans 6, right here in these verses, screams that Christ is greater. Christ is stronger than sin and death. There is grace which sanctifies because Christ is stronger. So if all what I've been saying is true, chapters 1 through 5 of Romans that speak of the justification, that speak all these big Theological words of propitiation and Christ being bearing our wrath and taking our penalty. These initial verses, which speak in chapter 6, about us dying to sin and being raised with Christ, we're united with Him, that Christ is stronger than sin and death. The question that maybe is going through your head, because it was going through my head, is why? Why, God, do I so still struggle with sin? Why do I wrestle with it so often? If all these things are spiritually true and real and legitimate about me, about my position with you, about my identity in Christ, why is there such a struggle with sin? It says in Galatians, it's for freedom that Christ has set me free. Why do I not experience that more frequently, more deeply? Why do I still wrestle with it so much? I was in a a study of the book of Romans with uh, Pastor Steve, and he does this every January for a week. He uh, holds himself up in the fireside room down here with, uh, you know, 10 to 12 other interns. And uh, he looks for 50 hours in one week, they look at the first eight chapters of Romans. I mean, that's 
That's getting it through a fire hose right there. That's a lot of, that's a lot of Bible. That's a lot of Romans there. Um, but I was going through this study with Steve. And we came in to, to this point of Romans 6 and asking this question. If all this is true, and we've been studying it for three and a half, four days by this point. We're just convinced of the power of the gospel. That God is able to change lives. And yet this question was raised and it just stopped us dead in our tracks. Why do we still wrestle with it so much? Why is it so hard? If it's true that we're dead to sin, why is it still so compelling, so enticing, so gripping in our lives? And one gal, Julie, responded in a way that kind of stopped us all dead in our tracks, caused us to kind of lean back and think about how profound it, it was in the moment. She says, it's, it's, like, it's like we're dead to sin, but sin is not dead to us. And what I think she was speaking to in that moment and, and kind of how I've interpreted it in the years following is, is this idea that, spiritually speaking, we are dead to sin. Yet the, the theological concept of total depravity means that every area of our life is impacted, tainted by sin. My eyes are tainted by sin. My mind is tainted with sin. My heart has affections that are tainted with sin. So then something comes across my radar, and I have all these moving parts, but all of them are tainted with sin. Spiritually speaking, I am dead to sin. No longer will I get life from sin. I did at one time for 18 years of my life. I got life from sin. Since that time, coming to Christ, spiritually speaking, it is a theological reality, a truth, that I am dead to sin. Yet these parts of my body are still tainted with sin. I still have the residual effect. You know, if, you're, if it was, you know, could, you, could you eat sin? I still have sin like, you know, crumbs here. And, and you know, I'm still working through the residual effects of sin that have clouded my mind for 18 years, that are on my heart, that have been brought forth in decisions, that are impacting relationships. And sin rears its ugly head again and again and again. And so therefore, we are called in Romans 6, verses 11, 12, and 13 to several things. And if you want to, this is, these are good passages to memorize, to put to heart. What is God calling us to do after all this buildup? What is God calling us to do? You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's kind of interesting. Because we already talked about that earlier in chapter 6, right? We're dead to sin and alive to Christ. And, and now God's command, his call to us, what's the verb that we're supposed to do in this sanctification process is to consider, to think about, to regard ourselves as dead to sin and alive to Christ. It's like, well, we already talked about that. That's interesting that that's part of my sanctification, that's part of my grace that is going to make me more holy and look like Jesus and choose away from sin? Yeah. You are to wake up daily and remind yourself of what is real and what is true. Consider yourself. Think about yourself. Don't forget. Preach this over and over and over again that you are dead to sin and you're alive to God in Christ. Don't forget it. Brand it on your mind. Remember this. Call it to memory often because you forget and I forget. We come sit here on Sunday, and then by Monday, we're just like, oh, man, I can't stand that guy. Ooh, if I could just get my hands around his neck. Right? And i got to come back and just remind ourselves, what's real? What's legit? Well, I'm dead to sin. I'm not going to get life from falling through on those things. I need to remind myself that there's life in Christ, Christ alone. Moving on in the passage, we must consider ourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are to not let sin reign in our mortal body so that we obey its passions and desires. You have place in your life for one master, Christ. And sin will constantly try to push him off the throne. You in your flesh will constantly try to push him off the throne so that you can obey, follow through, 
gratify yourself in sinful passions, obeying its thoughts and desires rather than the thoughts and desires of Christ. Don't let it rain. Don't let it get a foothold. Don't let it get a grip in your life, the Bible says. So we're to consider ourselves, regard ourselves, remember and preach to ourselves that we're dead to sin, alive to Christ. We're to not let sin reign. And thirdly, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Every morning, every day, moment by moment, you have an opportunity whether you're going to offer up your mind, your heart, your life, your decisions, your will to God that he might sanctify, make holy, make pure, and use those for righteousness' sake? Or you can shirk God, stiff arm him, go it alone. Letting sin reign, offering up the members, the parts of your body as instruments for unrighteousness. I was convicted by what Thomas Watson said about this idea of presenting the parts of our body up to God, he hits on the mind here. He says, The first fruit of love is the musing of the mind upon God. He who is in love, his thoughts are ever upon the object. By this way, we may test our love to God. What are our thoughts most upon? Oh, how far are they? from being lovers of God who scarcely ever think of God. A sinner, I put myself in this camp, crowds God out of his thoughts. He doesn't let God reign. He doesn't offer up his mind and the different parts of his body as instruments for righteousness, of connecting with his, the one who loves him, the one who has died for him. God becomes common, base, normal. Before long, there's no worship. There's no warmth toward God. And this is where it gets real. The next set of verses is if we don't take 11, 12, and 13 seriously, which flow from, they come out of the first six chapters there. And if we don't take this battle and this sanctification process seriously, We're going to see two journeys here, two very divergent journeys about those who sanctify and those who do not. Look at these, this is the truth. Sin will have no dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. That is a truth, that is the truth I think in this passage. Do you believe that? That sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. What then? Are we, to sin, are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. You being in relationship with Christ, you having a connection with God through his Holy Spirit, does not lead you to sin. Rather, what is consistent with the relationship with Christ is sanctification, is holiness. Let's see what this looks like. Verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves To anyone, as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." Experiencing freedom in Christ does not mean you get freedom from him. Rather, you get freedom with him. And you become a slave of righteousness. You become a slave of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Or of sin, which leads to death. All of us at one time were slaves of sin. But thankfully, by God's grace, he has entered in. And in the process of doing so, hopefully, by God's grace, we are changing paths, having been set free from sin, becoming slaves of righteousness. 
And then he says this, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. This, this verse stops me in my tracks because when, when I read, just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, for me, my mind jumps to high school. Because I did not follow Jesus in high school. And so I'll be, I'll be just going about my day, checking my Facebook, checking my Twitter, and then some you know, friend or acquaintance uh, or person I never met from high school shows up in my news feed, because now we're Facebook friends. Uh, <laughs> we never talked, but we're, we're Facebook friends now. And, and they come through my news feed. And I met with two simultaneous emotions. One is joy at getting to hear what is going on in their lives right now. Maybe they got married, maybe they're having kids, maybe they moved, they got a job. Uh, I found out one guy's working for NBC, you know, in L.A. It's like, that's cool. That's great. And the other emotion is just dread. It's just like, oh, man. It's just so unfortunate how I treated them. That was just, I was just wrong. That was just bad. I was so full of myself. Oh, man. And I have these simultaneous emotions when I see somebody in my feed that knew me before I met Jesus. Because I was offering up the members of my body as slaves to impurity, which led to lawlessness and more lawlessness and more lawlessness. It says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But core, but you, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. Do you hear about that? There's two, there's two journeys, there's two paths here. One is one that responds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, he sets your feet on a new path that leads to obedience and righteousness and sanctification. Those who disregard the gospel are free in regard to righteousness' sake, but as a result, we yield to impurity and to lawlessness. And as this passage states, the end of those things, where does that journey lead? What's the end of that path? Death. No connection to God. No connection to that which is truly life. But here's the good news. Now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Do you hear that? Down this road, those that respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have made, God has made peace with through his son, that the power of gospel is manifested and it saves. There's grace that saves you. No longer are you under the dominion of the law. No longer are you under the dominion of sin and death. Rather, he set your feet on a rock, the rock of Christ, and he has brought you forth in the newness of life. You've died with, with Christ, and now you've been raised to walk in newness of life. And on this path, on this journey, as it says there, this leads to life change, to sanctification. You remember, you regard yourself as you really, really, truly, truly are, not as people see you, not as what they say to you, that you can never change. No, you've been changed. And now you need to regard yourself, to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its passions. Rather, you offer up the parts of your body as instruments for righteousness. And as you go on this road, sanctification comes. And the end of this is eternal life. There is grace that saves you, grace that sanctifies you, and there is a grace that will glorify you one day in the presence of God. That's where this journey ends. Eternal life, face to face with God. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the stakes. The grace that justifies, this is in our statement of faith. This is, this is a theological belief that the, the elders of this church hold. The, the faith 
that justifies, necessarily sanctifies. These are two sides of the same coin. If there is justification, it necessarily leads to sanctification. These two are consistent with one another. These are our hope in light of the gospel. This is our hope for life change. With that, I want to pause, see if there's any questions.